leave the practice session? No. Mm -mm. Maybe, I don't know. Okay, here come our attendees. Welcome, welcome everyone. Type in the chat where you're from. We have people from all over the world. Type it in. Yes, welcome, welcome. Missouri, Connecticut, Florida, Maine, Illinois, Texas, Canada, wow. California, some people got up early this morning to join us. <laughs> Australia, wow. Canada, wow. Canada. Mm -hmm. Welcome, welcome. We'll wait a few seconds yet to let everybody in and then we will get started. South Africa. I saw Croatia, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> Philippines, Wyoming. Wow, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning or whatever time it is where you are. Mm. Malaysia, mm. Lithuania, oh my goodness. <laughs> Nancy, you are known <laughs> everywhere. I don't know about that. I think maybe your branches. <laughs> And the Reading League, Florida. I, that I had a student from there once um, at FIU. <laughs> um, interesting, interesting. All right. I think it's slowing down a little bit, so I think we will get started. So good morning, everyone, from wherever you are. And welcome to the third session of our Lunch and Learn webinar series for 2022. My name is Judy Cohen, and I serve as the current president of the International Dyslexia Association Florida branch. On behalf of our entire board, I want to welcome you to this webinar, and thank you for taking time from your Saturday to join us. I also want to mention that the, the Reading League Florida is co-presenting this session, so we want to reach out and thank them and ask you to also check their Facebook page and their website. Um, a few reminders before we get started. Our vision in, for IDA Florida is that all students in Florida will receive structured literacy instruction provided by effective teachers who understand the science of reading. Recordings and resources from previous sessions are available on our website, fl.dyslexiaida.org. We will be posting in the chat the PowerPoint and the resource materials for this session. So uh, look out in the chat and Mandy will be posting them several times throughout the session. So you can feel free to click on the link and print them out if you so desire. Um, also know that everyone will be muted, but feel free to use the chat and the Q&A tools throughout the session. There will be a Q&A after the presentation and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. I do want to let everyone know because we always have questions about the certificates of attendance. Um, teachers uh, can earn ESC credits toward their 20 hour ESC recertification requirement and or earn in service points toward the required 40 points needed for the recertification requirement for House Bill 7069. Participants should check with their individual counties, CEU or ESC coordinator to determine if the CEU would be accepted. But in order to receive your certificate of attendance for each webinar, you must attend the webinar in its entirety and it must be attended live. Attendance and time spent in session is recorded electronically during the live session. Those who attend the session in its entirety will receive a certificate of attendance approximately one to two weeks following the webinar. So now we're getting down to the good part. So today's session is the Reading Comprehension Blueprint, the why, the what, and a bit of the how. And our amazing presenter is Nancy Hennessy, who goes back a long time and has wealth, a wealth of information regarding everything to do with reading, including comprehension. So I'm just going to read a little bit about our author, and then she'll get into the content of today's webinar. So Nancy currently works as a literacy consultant. She's an experienced teacher and administrator who has worked across the grade levels in both regular and special education. While in public schools, she provided leadership in the development of professional learning systems for all educators. 
innovative programming for special needs students, and a statewide revision of special education code. She's a former Wilson language lead trainer and national trainer for one of my favorite PDs of all time, Letters, which we know as Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. Nancy has and continues to design and deliver keynotes as well as virtual and live workshops and training courses. Most recently, Nancy has focused on virtual and in-person professional learning opportunities related to reading comprehension. She has co-authored module six of Letters, Digging for Meaning, Teaching Text Comprehension with Louisa Motes, another one of my all favorite people in the world. <laughs> Her chapter, Working with Word Meaning Vocabulary Instruction, is in the fourth edition of Multisensory Teaching of Basic Skills, another awesome resource. Um, Nancy has held various positions on a variety of boards, including serving as president of the International Dyslexia Association and as a member of the National Joint Committee for uh, Learning Disabilities. She's an honorary member of the Delta Kappa Gamma Society and the 2011 recipient of IDA's Margaret Lawson Lifetime Achievement Award. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome and thank Nancy Hennessy for joining us this morning. Nancy, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Judith. Let me see if I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. And here we go. All right. No, we don't want the whiteboard. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that happened before. Here we go. There it is. Wonderful. All right. And there we are. Well, let me begin by thanking the Florida branch of the International Dyslexia Association and also the co-sponsor of the Reading League Florida for inviting me this morning. But most of all, I wanna thank each and every one of you who are joining us this morning. I cannot believe how many of you have signed up for this, um, both nationally and internationally. So thank you, thank you. I am a teacher. I am here this morning to share with you what I have learned about reading comprehension, which I recently wrote about in my book, The Reading Comprehension Blueprint. This morning, we'll be talking about the why, the what, and a bit of the how. For those of you who intend to join the book study that the Florida branch will be sponsoring, um, this represents a synthesis of chapters one through three. For those of you who are not, um, this provides essential background knowledge, foundational knowledge about comprehension, its complexity, and direction for instruction. So welcome, welcome, and let's get going because I have lots to share please access the PowerPoint. And there is a participant guide that I will be referencing from time to time that you may want to also reference and perhaps script um, some thoughts as we move forward. Now, I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about change and the fact that in 2017, um, the illustrious Mark Seidenberg uh, said there's a profound disconnection between the science of reading and educational practice. And I think each and every one of us could agree to that. But I think what's so, so encouraging for all of us is we're beginning to see that change take place, even though the science of reading has been around for what, 20, 30 years. And some of the evidence of that include some of these publications that I've included here, including the work of the National Council on Teacher Quality here in the United States, in the United States, Louisa Motz's recent um, update on teaching reading is rocket science. Of course, the Facebook, the science of reading, and then the science of reading defining guide, which the Reading League has published, and uh, the update of the IDA knowledge and practice standards. These are all leading the way along with many, many other publications and individuals who are speaking to this. Thank heavens. But at the same time, <clears throat> I think that there's been such a focus on word recognition and please know that I was the queen of decoding um, for many, many years um, and recognized that in order to be able to work with text, we have to be able to read the text. And so we have had an emphasis on word recognition. But at the same time, I think many feel that the science reading of reading is only about word recognition. And it is much more than that, isn't it? It's also about comprehension. Because after all, when we think about skilled readers, what are they able to do? not only read the words, but also make meaning of the text. That's the ultimate goal, to make meaning to learn from the text. So let's keep in mind that the science of reading, all right, does address comprehension as well. And we'll be speaking about that this morning. 
I also wanted to say to each and every one of you that I recognize what you've brought to this session today. So I wanna honor what it is that you know and what you have been doing, but I also want to encourage you to be thinking about not only continuing to do what is effective, but also to change course when the science tells us to do so. At the same time, I, I'm very, very well aware that we all uh, work in different contexts. And so sometimes that change can be bit by bit, and sometimes it can be more than that. So it's determined by our context. But as you Katz has said to us, we need to create the conditions for comprehension. So that's what we're all about this morning. At the same time, I know that each and every one of you has joined this morning in recognition of the fact that we need to be learners, that learning is our work just as it is the work of our students. So in the very wise words of Louisa Motes, we can't rely on implicit understanding, whether it be word recognition or comprehension, explicit teaching really requires explicit understanding. So we're all about that here this morning. So the reading comprehension blueprint, we're going to talk about the why, and that will lead us into a conversation on the complexity of comprehension. So buckle up here, there's going to be a lot of information. And um, I recognize that every once in a while, take a deep breath and take away what it is that you can, make connections to what it is that you know. We're going to talk about the what, and the what, of course, is the blueprint for instruction. And we'll be speaking to the components of the blueprint. And then we're going to pull out one of those components and talk a bit about the how. We're going to talk about sentence comprehension. Originally, I had hoped I'd have time for both sentence comprehension and background knowledge, but all of us know as educators, uh, whether we're teachers, specialists, cl clinicians, we, we all know that we, we oftentimes have to review and revise our lesson plans as we really think about implementing them. So focus, comp comprehension, sentence comprehension, a bit of the how this morning. All right. So I want you thinking about the complexity of comprehension. And if you were able to download the facilitator guide, or if you just want to script a few words for yourself right now, I want you to be thinking about what, what is your mental model of comprehension? What do you understand comprehension to be? What do you think about when I say it's complex? And we're going to dive into that by using a description provided by researchers in Castle, Castles and her colleagues. So here it is, all right? And I'm going to invite you as I read this to you that you read along, all right? So reading comprehension is not a single entity that can be explained by a unified cognitive model. And I've highlighted that because we're going to take this description or definition apart. We're going to work through it. And that will be the first aspect of the definition that we'll address. All right, let's continue. Instead, it is the orchestrated product of a set of linguistic and cognitive processes. Hmm, we'll have to think about that. Operating on text and interacting with background knowledge, features of the text, and the purpose and goals of the reading situation. So now let's step back and think a little bit about it not being a single entity that can be explained by a unified cognitive model. Now, I think for many of us, when we think about skilled reading, when we think about reading comprehension, all right, when we know the science, what certainly comes to mind is the simple view. And the simple view was uh, developed uh, by Goff and Tummer in 1986. It has stood the test of time. There are multiple, multiple research studies that have reviewed and validated the simple view, all right? And there are many, many citations, certainly, in the research. When we think about this, of course, we think about two factors, the first being decoding, or as it is now in the literature called word recognition, and then linguistic comprehension, or we could talk about it as language comprehension. And we all know that both of these factors are necessary, all right, in order to have reading comprehension. We also know that Goff and Tummer certainly didn't view reading comprehension as being simple. And so this was a way of beginning to explain the complexity, actually, of reading comprehension. Um, and more recently, in 2020, all right, Tunmer, along with Wes Hoover, actually um, took a look at, or reflected on, I should say, uh, the simple view. And they then um, authored 
a new book um, on the cognitive foundations of reading. And this elaborates on the simple view. Um, it uh, further explains to us the complexity, in fact, of reading comprehension. And so I'll give you a moment just to take a look at this model. And so what you see on the right-hand side of the screen here, or the right-hand side of the model, is word recognition and the varied components that go into word recognition. Um, they've talked about this as alphabetic coding skill and then further break this down into skill sets or knowledge sets. What we're most interested in this morning is the left-hand side of the model, and that is the side that represents language comprehension. And note how they've broken that down into, first of all, linguistic knowledge, and you see varied systems of language, including phonological, syntactic, and semantic knowledge represented here, and then background knowledge and inferencing skills. So immediately we can begin to think about the fact that it's not a single entity, and there are multiple cognitive models. This is just one. There certainly are others, such as Perfetti and Strafora's uh, reading systems framework, and we could go on and define others as well. Kate Nation, I think, sums this up for us quite nicely by telling us that, first of all, we need to be thinking about what the ultimate goal of reading comprehension is. But then she goes on to talk about the fact that for many of us, in fact, most of us, you know, um, when we read um, and make meaning, it feels pretty effortless. It flows along naturally, particularly when we're familiar with the text. And she's saying to us, this belies the complexity, even when the text is quite straightforward, because even when we are reading with ease, there are multiple, multiple processes and skills that we are engaging in order to make meaning of the text. All right. So what about this second aspect of the description that Anne Castles and her colleagues has provided for us? Comprehension is the orchestrated product of a set of linguistic and cognitive processes. So if you've been able to access the facilitator guide, all right, there's a question there, <laughs> number two. It says, is your instructional approach focused on process or product? Now, you don't have to answer that right away. I think we need to delve into this a little bit more deeply, and then perhaps you'll want to come back and reflect on that question. All right, so let's think a little bit about what do we mean by product in terms of reading comprehension? And what do we mean by processes? All right. So here's a quick check, all right? So what are comprehension products and what are comprehension processes? Well, comprehension products are the indicators of what the reader knows and understands after reading is completed. In other words, the outcome. Right. Oftentimes when I ask educators to define reading comprehension for me, they define it in terms of what they expect their students to be able to do. Summarize, identify main idea, and so on. That's an outcome, isn't it? All right. It's a product of being able to make meaning of what it is that we read. And in fact, we can think about the classroom and what we expect of our students as they read texts and the kinds of responses that we expect from them both in writing um, or orally. And so for instance, if we're working with a little first grader, all right, and they're reading the book, I am enough. And we ask the question, what did you learn from the girl in this book, all right? Who has many differences, but her grandmother encourages her to be herself, all right? To understand she is enough. When you ask that question, your student's response is a reflection of whether or not they understand the text. It's a product or an outcome. Or if you're working with a fifth grader, Kayla, and, they're re and Kayla's reading the one and only Ivan. And of course, this is a story about a gorilla who lives in a zoo, which is in a mall. Mm. And you ask, what did you learn about yourself from Ivan? The response, a product. And we could look at each one of these at different grade levels in terms of different types of texts, um, including perhaps finally in eighth grade, reading a selection about Stalin, a brutal legacy, Geraldo. Why was Stalin fearful for his life? We also can be thinking about the fact that when we want our students reading, the ultimate product is this overall understanding of the text. It's a mental model that the student takes with them. It's the big ideas that they take with them that they can apply to future readings as well. 
right? As I'm talking about this, you might be making connections to standards. And of course, we have different standards in each one of our states. Internationally, I'm sure there are varied standards that you're writing goals and objectives that relate to those standards. So this is an example from the, from the Common Core English Language Arts Standards, um, College and Career Readiness Anger Standards, and these are really products. We want our students to be able to interpret words and phrases as they are used in a text. We want our students to be an, able to analyze how two or more texts address similar themes. We want them to read um, and comprehend complex literary and informational texts. We want them to be able to understand what the text says explicitly, as well as to make inference. All of those are products, outcomes, all right? So thinking about the fact that comprehension is the orchestrated product, all right, of, of what? Of language and cognitive processes. So it's the language and cognitive activities by which the reader arrives at those products. Even if you begin to think a little bit about how do we arrive at products, all right, that are different than uh, those that are produced in the classroom, we could almost think of an assembly line. We could think of about a large Amazon warehouse, for instance, and all the uh, individuals that have to contribute and uh, engage in various um, uh, processes in order for the product, the delivery of the goods to be shipped to the consumer. So processes matter, processes matter. High quality products, high quality processes, all right? So I'm wondering as I was talking about language and cognitive processes, if you were thinking a little bit about the reading rope, I'm sure some of you were thinking, why hasn't she mentioned that reading rope yet? And of course, the reading rope is this wonderful visual metaphor provided to us by Hollis Scarborough to explain what? To explain skilled reading, this ability to read the words and to make meaning simultaneously. And what are we interested in? Well, yes, we're always interested in developing word recognition, but our focus for today is language comprehension. So thinking about oral language capabilities, what the, what the student is bringing to school, the child brings to school, what they're using in order to understand what they're hearing, all right, because oftentimes reading by ear, as well as by eye, particularly for our students who are struggling. But then being able to make the transition, of course, to the written text. And it becomes our responsibility really to be teaching them to be developing those skills and abilities that allow for them to work with that written text. So we know these strands of the rope, background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, um, including semantics and syntax, verbal reasoning, including inference, literacy, print knowledge, um, including knowledge of different text types, genre. All of these are woven together tightly, working in concert with one another. These are language skills, all right? So when we think about language processes, we can think about these strands of the rope. We also can think a little bit about the work of O'Kill and Kane. Not a little bit, I think a lot about this work. And we can think about how um, uh, they describe these different levels of language processing that come into play when the reader listens or when the reader comes to text. So I'm going to give you a moment to read that to yourself. All right, so access the meaning. There's the vocabulary strand of the rope. Work out the syntactic structure and sense of each sentence. There's the language structures, right? And here comes that mental model, that overall understanding again. Integrate information from different sentences. This is a type of inference. It's actual called, actually called local coherence inference. And then the incorporation of background knowledge. This is global coherence inference so that what the students can make sense of the details that are implicit within the text. So all of these things need to be in place, all right, in order for our students to be able to make meaning of the text, not just to produce the product, the summary, the main idea, identification, but also to develop these different strands of the reading rope, these different levels of language processing. Now you might be saying to yourself, but I heard you say something about language and cognitive activities. I did, 
In fact, what I want to do is make this connection for you between the cognitive processes that are necessary to make meaning of text to these language processes. And I've used a model developed by Judith Irwin um, and then adapted it um, to explain this. So when we begin to think about what's going on in the mind of the reader, all right, they're engaging in what's called microprocessing. They're identifying idea units within the text. That means they have to know the meaning of the words and how to work with the sentences. They're also engaging in integrative processes. That means that they have to be able to integrate ideas within and between sentences, right? So the sentences are explicit, but what's implicit is how the connections can be made. For instance, when we use a pronoun to represent a who or a what in a previous sentence. We also want our readers engaging in metacognitive processing, that overall understanding, that monitoring of whether or not the text is making sense. Of course, elaborative processing is taking place as well, which means that the student has to be integrating prior knowledge and making, as I said earlier, inference. And finally, engaging in what's called macro processes. And you know what that is? That's the organization of the overall understanding of text. It's the creation of the mental model. I want all of you to keep in mind that while we're very focused on skills and strategy in comprehension, they are a means to an end. What's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is learning, it's knowledge, it's taking away an understanding of what it is that you've read and how that applies in ways to other texts and to other topics that you may be discussing. So thinking about the fact that comprehension is a dynamic process, it occurs moment by moment as the reader extracts and constructs meaning. Now, I think um, it's important for me to make connections then to those students who are struggling, right? And one of the things that I was struck by a number of years ago, 2014, was an article that I read by Spencer Quinn and Wagner. And one of the things they talked about is individuals with reading problems and reading comprehension that are not attributable to poor word recognition, because that can be the source, right? But if it's not attributable to poor word recognition, then these comprehension problems are general to language comprehension rather than specific to reading. They went so far as to suggest we call these language comprehension problems, not reading comprehension problems. Very interesting that we keep that in mind. And then Kate Kane, again, who I mentioned earlier, the work of Jane O'Kill and Kate Kane has said, you know, there are some very specific processes that um, poor readers have difficulty with integration and inference making. There's that connection of within and between sentences. I'll talk some more about that later. And also this ability to integrate information, that's the incorporation of background knowledge. They also seem to struggle with the monitoring of an understanding. In a moment, you'll see that I'll make that connection to the process development, all right, and skill development. And then knowledge and use of story structure, which really they didn't just mean narrative text, they were really talking about the overall structure. Here's the importance then the connection to teaching text structure. Now I also know that some of you are thinking, well, children or individuals with dyslexia often, um, uh, you know, their, their problems primarily are in the word recognition area. And some of these students um, don't have language comprehension problems. No, they don't. In fact, oftentimes they come to school with strong language, but when they do not have access to text, what do we think happens to those language capabilities that are going to be necessary to deal with the more academic texts of school? Secondly, many of our students have coexisting conditions, individuals with dyslexia, language-based difficulties, difficulty with specific language, um, uh, expressive or expressive or receptive language. So we need to keep that in mind as well, All right? So you might be thinking, wow, she just spent a lot of time talking about products and processes. Why is that? Well, that is because um, our scientific community, our researchers tell us that it is important that we be thinking about the processes, the skills that go into the ability to produce the product. 
that oftentimes, as Ken Diao has said, this comes from a research study with uh, children with learning disabilities, when a child is repeatedly unsuccessful in comprehending text he or she has read, this suggests reading difficulties at the processing level. They can manifest themselves in varied ways, failure to identify the main points, failure to answer literal and or inferential questions, or the failure to complete the actual reading of text and so on. So oftentimes when we think about intervention for our students, we have to be thinking about those skills and strategies that we need to, or strategies that we need to use to develop those skills that enable students to work with the overall meaning, to accumulate, to successively make meaning um, so that they can uh, demonstrate um, or show us that they understand what it is that they're reading. Now, the last component um, of this particular um, uh, description or definition has everything to do with what the role of the reader, the text, the task in comprehension. So the last question I asked you was, you know, are you process or product oriented? And you may want to be thinking about that now and return to that at some point. But now I'm asking you yet another question, all right? And I'm asking you the question, what do you know about the role of the reader, the text, the task in comprehension? Because some of you, and by the way, this is in your interactive guide as well, if you want to script or if you just want to script to the side, um, some of you may have immediately thought about the RAND Reading Study Group Report. And I'm hoping that you did because this, this part of our talk is really all about the science, isn't it? All right. So in 2002, the RAND Reading Study Group um, came together to look at the issue of comprehension and to provide further direction for research um, and action in the area of reading comprehension. And they developed this heuristic, this is a model, right, that represents the varied dimensions of comprehension. And this really aligns very much with that Castle's description and what we know about the complexity of comprehension. But it's calling attention to the fact that this really is a dynamic interaction between the reader, the text, and the task. And so it reminds us that the text difficulty, um, it will vary. And it's based on the content, what it is we're reading about, the vocabulary, more often as we move up through the grades, as we use age and grade appropriate text, vocabulary that goes beyond that Anglo-Saxon layer of the language, all right? more complex vocabulary, linguistic structures, syntactic structures that are complex in nature, and even the characteristics of, of different genre. So we think a little bit here, some of you may be thinking about lexiles, you know, and co-metrics, which gives us, that's a measure that we can use that gives us a sense of text cohesion and these varied aspects of the text that we need to be thinking about as the students interact because they need to bring and interact with the text, these varied cognitive capacities, we've been talking about them this morning, levels of motivation, and varied types of knowledge that allows for them not only skills, but a knowledge base that allows for them to interact with the text. And of course, each and every time we determine what the purpose is. So moving from skimming to studying, literal to inferential understanding, so that will affect the way that the student interacts with the text and then the broad context. And I think it's important that we keep in mind the socio-cultural context that's so, so important, um, but also that we think about ourselves as educators, specialists, clinicians, and so on, as being the individuals who provide the immediate context, the instructional context, the classroom learning environment. So I know that this has been a great deal of information, but I did begin by saying comprehension is quite complex. And so when we begin to think about instruction, we have to be thinking about the fact that the complexity of comprehension drives instruction. And I wanted to be able to represent perhaps graphically for you some of what I've been talking about in terms of these interactions that occur between the read of the text, the task, and the demands um, of the text itself. So we have the reader in the upper right-hand corner and she's ready to read A Long Walk to Water, a wonderful book that can be used 
um, at multiple grade levels, but probably best from about fifth, sixth grade on. And the story of two young people in Sudan, one of them being a lost boy, the other being a young woman, and both of them have to walk many, many miles for water. And it's a story of survival and perseverance, right? Within that book, all right, what the reader, what she has to deal with, or he, all right, um, they, them, and so on, um, they have to deal with the words and phrases. And in reading age and grade appropriate text or listening, this is academic vocabulary, and they need to bring a breadth, recognition, a depth, an ownership, an understanding of how precise words are used. They also have to bring their knowledge of sentence and sentence density. Many sentences have multiple ideas within one sentence. Many sentences are long. How do they parse those? They have to bring a knowledge of structure, different types of structure, um, simple, compound, complex, all right? Um, they have to bring a knowledge of cohesive ties and connectives. And these are the, the words or phrases that help to tie up the meaning within and between sentences, that integration I was talking about. They bring their knowledge, schema. They bring their knowledge of text structure. That's a specialized type of background knowledge. Mm, that's interesting. And that allows them to make inference. And of course, the goal here is, and that's cut off a bit, I'm sorry, co a co a creating this understanding of text, a coherent representation, all of the ideas hanging together in a meaningful way, all right? So they're using all of these processes that we talked about. They're using all these different levels of language, all right, in order to engage in those processes. They're working at the surface level of the text with the exact words, literal understanding, they're working at the text space where they have to integrate and incorporate background knowledge. They have to use inference. And ultimately, they're creating a mental model. This is what we want for each and every one of our students. Skilled readers use both language and cognitive processes to integrate successive units of meaning at that surface level, exact words, at the text base, what's lying underneath the surface implied, this is necessary for that overall understanding. The mental model, once more, is the reader's overall understanding of the situation expressed in the text. The reader stores this in memory and hopefully accesses it for future application. So there is the description that I provided for you in talking about the complexity of text. I'm going to give you a moment to reread it and to reflect on this because in your participant guide, it's asking you what's your mental model now of the complexity of comprehension? Where did you begin? What did you bring with you? What can you now add to that? All right, take a moment and reread. Now, I know that there are many, many definitions I could have provided you with, uh, many from uh, the Rand Reading Study Group report from NAEP, some that come from other work, but I think this one really captured that idea of the complexity. So the complexity of comprehension, hopefully you've added to your mental model, maybe not all that we've just, just discussed, but again, beginning to think perhaps differently, or maybe what I said was everything you already knew and you're patting yourself on the back. All right. So we're going to move on to the what, all right? We're going to move on to now based on the science, because if not science, then what? If we have the science, then that needs to guide us in terms of developing our instructional plans. So based on the science, what could a blueprint for comprehension instruction include? What are the components? If we want to construct the comprehension house, all right, we need a blueprint. What might that look like? And so I've provided for you um, a quick read in the facilitator guide. But if you don't have the facilitator guide, I'm going to give you a moment to read this because it's a brief description from, from the book that I've written about this um, that gives you a sense of what the blueprint actually is.
Nancy, I just want to interrupt for a moment. The sure. participants do have access to the uh, to the handout and to the PowerPoint. So it's in the chat. I just want to make sure you were aware of that. Okay. Great. Terrific. All right. So here's my quick summary of this, and I've just pulled out some of the important words. It's a master plan, both process and product demands. It's meant to organize and scaffold to support the teacher's preparation. Keep in mind, it's not a lesson plan. It's not a unit organizer. It's the big picture. It does call for the use of evidence-informed strategies and activities. So, but in the service of what? In the service of those language processes and skills, in the service of then producing product. So very targeted strategy and activity specific to what it is we're developing and what we expect in terms of product. It allows for flexibility, text, student and context, and it uses lots of questions to prompt us to be metacognitive because after all, we are, when we are effective teachers, metacognitive about our instruction. So here's the blueprint. And again, you have this in your slides, all right, in handout number one, but you also have a larger version of this in the participant guide that you can go back and reference or take a look at now. So I wanna call attention to how this blueprint presents. What you have on the left-hand side of the blueprint are the topics for, um, the topics that need to be addressed as one prepares for instruction and as one engages with your students, either paired or with them or independently in text reading. But then what we have on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, so that's the left-hand side, the topics we're going to focus on. On the right-hand side, we have questions that relate to those topics. The kinds of questions we can be asking ourselves as we think through this master plan. And I'll be talking about some of these individually, but for example, critical understandings of text. What do you want your students to know and understand after reading the text? What concepts and understandings, big ideas, do you want your students to acquire? The same is true when one moves down into the text reading. And here, I'm sure you thought to yourself, wow, that looks a little bit like the strands of the reading rope, the levels of language processing. Uh-huh, all right. When we move over here, again, we have a series of questions, all right? So for vocabulary, which words will your students need to know, which are worth knowing? Which ones will you intentionally target and directly teach? Which ones will you incidentally, what I call incidentally on purpose teach, how and when? Which words will you purposefully discuss, incorporate into expressive language? How and when will you teach and foster the use of independent word learning strategies? Now, yes, the questions are mine, but they're based in the research. They come from the literature on how best to teach vocabulary. And that's true for all of the questions. You probably also saw that there's a bi-directional arrow and I'll be talking more about this, but this has everything to do with what happens before, during and after reading and the importance of comprehension monitoring. So I'm going to move on. I want you to know that all of these levels of language processing work in inter, uh, uh, both independently and interactively. So they work in concert with one another. Sometimes we develop them independently, but keep in mind that is that successive building of meaning that each of these are contributing to and working with one another to contribute to the overall understanding of text. Now, this is a comprehension house. Just a quick reminder of how we use the blueprint to build the house. Critical understandings, and there's our comprehension monitoring, the main support beams here, vocabulary and background knowledge, and then thinking about sentence comprehension, text structures, and then asking our students questions at different levels of understanding and putting the roof on reading comprehension, house completed. All right. So we're going to begin to focus on just a little bit then of preparing um, the blueprint. And if you take a look at your blueprint, um, or if you re recall what I just mentioned, there are three different components that we think about um, in terms of preparing for the blueprint. Critical understandings, purpose for reading, 
and purposeful readings. And here then again are the questions that we ask ourselves. What do we want our students to know, understand, big ideas? What are the content goals and, and, and objectives? What are the literacy skill goals and objectives? And which what readings will serve your purpose? So very quickly, um, when we talk about these uh, enduring understandings, we're talking about big ideas. And you can see to the left, um, a synthesis of what individuals should understand, not just know or do, the thread that links units, lessons, and year-to-year -year teaching. Some of you are very um, familiar with uh, understanding by design, um, uh, uh, Wiggins and McTee's work, and so on, all right? We might be saying to ourselves, what's that essential knowledge base that we want to develop across grades and disciplines? Are there enduring concepts and understandings we want our students to have? What are the essential questions, all right? The focus here is the fact that when you think about comprehension, it's not just about developing literacy skills. Yes, we have to have those skills, but what's the end goal here? It's learning. Why do we read to make meaning? It's so that we understand and that we learn. So content goals, as well as literacy skill goals. And so Shanahan reminds us again, based in what our experts in the field are telling us, too often the emphasis of a reading lesson is so much on reading skill or strategy that the opportunity to expand children's understanding of their world is lost. Reading lessons need to have double outcomes, an improvement in reading ability, and increased understanding about whatever was read. So these larger concepts principles or processes. So we, our purpose here for reading overall, whether we're reading just you know, a short selection or we're reading connected selections based on a theme or big understandings, we need to have both literacy and content goals. And I thought you might like to see um, an example of some of these big ideas or enduring understandings. So very quickly, for instance, stories teach us important life lessons. Think about stories about activists such as Benjamin Banneker or Rosa Parks, right? Animals have stories to tell and can teach us about ourselves. Think about a story such as the one and only Ivan, right? And what we can learn about ourselves as human beings from the lessons that Ivan teaches us. Individuals can change the course of history. Think about dictatorship, Stalin's brutal legacy. There are multiple causes for conflict. The American Re Revolution, uh, the founding of a democracy, and change is inevitable and is both positive and negative. How about, how about um, Esperanza rising in the time of depression? All right. So one can think about the fact that we can begin to relook, rethink the curriculum we currently have, the readings that we currently use, and begin to think about what are some of the big lessons that come from these particular um, narrative, um, but also then our informational text, which might be more focused on disciplines such as science, social studies, and so on. All right, choosing purposeful readings. All right, well, I wanna make the point here that certainly decodable, and level text can be used for comprehension purposes. However, however, as we think about academic texts, as we think about academic language, the language of school, we need to be thinking about developing that academic language. So from the time children come to school, all right, yes, decodable for word recognition, absolutely essential practice, and yes, asking comprehension questions, laying down foundation, but our children should also be hearing until they can read independently age and grade appropriate texts that develop the language knowledge as Mar Marilyn Adams has said to us and the appreciation of mode of thought that is necessary to work with these texts. Shanahan also makes this point. There's little excuse for not using reading materials that expose children to classical literature or to rich content about geography, history, science, social studies, and other subjects. Just because it's a reading lesson, there's no reason that the content of the text one is practicing with can't be rich in information. So important that we keep this in mind. And when I speak to the topic of comprehension, I speak to using age and grade appropriate texts, text reading by ear and eventually by eye, 
from the time children come to school to develop the language capabilities that are necessary to work with the academic texts of school, whether it be narrative or informational texts, right? Representing varied disciplines, all right? And here's some examples of what I consider purposeful readings. If in fact you were able to design a unit of study, I know that's not possible for everyone, but this is representative of thinking about an enduring understanding, change is inevitable and is both positive and negative. Texts that are age and grade appropriate for around fourth or fifth grade, right? That represent different genre, all right? That allow for students to be thinking about and using rich language and topics that are meaningful. All right. So here's um, a self-reflect and this is in your participant guide. And this has everything to do with um, uh, the text that you use. All right, and I'm going to give you a moment again to read this to yourself and be thinking about the current text that you use. And remember, I began by saying, sometimes change is bit by bit. So maybe you're thinking about, oh yeah, the texts that we have satisfy or the texts I use satisfy these criteria. Or you might be thinking, hmm, there might be a way I could change just a little bit, perhaps supplement what I'm doing in order to better meet, or maybe you're in the process of changing course quite a bit. Take a moment and read to yourself. I'll just make note of that last one. Have you considered access issues for struggling readers? I'll just briefly share my own experience. At some point in my career, quite a long time ago, I worked in middle school as a resource room teacher, a special educator. And I worked with boys in both seventh and eighth grade who were bright, capable, all right, but who had not yet acquired word recognition, all right? I was fortunate in that setting, we brought in Orton Gillingham, all right? But um, had been denied access to age and grade appropriate texts and as a result, their language had suffered, all right? And so this was a struggle for us because they were academically capable. And so we had to begin to think about how do we change that for those students? What text should we be using, all right? All right, so that's a quick reflect. All right, well, now I'm going to move us into, I know what everybody wants to talk about, um, preparing for text reading. And you're going to note that bi-directional arrow, which I'll spend just a couple of minutes on because I really want to get into sentence comprehension. But please note that the comprehension house, the blueprint, all right, addresses not just sentence comprehension, but vocabulary, background knowledge, text structures, Levels of understanding and expression of understanding is included in the blueprint. These are all working interactively. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind. So that bi-directional arrow just reminds us that we need to be explicit in instruction, structured, systematic, and scaffolded. Yes, structured literacy. Um, that we can be flexible in terms of how we use the blueprint, whole group, small group, individual instruction that we're always using evidence-based instructional routines, strategies, and activities. And the flexibility here is determined by the student need, the text that you're using. And when you use these different strategies and activities before, during, and after, all right? So flexibility for the educator. Right. In terms of comprehension monitoring, I know that oftentimes our students encounter speed bumps. And so the question becomes, what should they do? Well, fix it up. But I, in order to fix it up, I think one has to understand why they're having difficulty, all right? So is it at the word meaning level? And we need to teach them to be thinking about this. Is it because they can't work with the sentences? Does it have something to do with their background knowledge and the connection to what it is that they're reading? Or their overall understanding of a paragraph or section or even their ability to stay engaged. And so here under fix it up, um, and again, you have this represented in your participant guide. 
but also in the in the PowerPoint handout. Um, we need to be thinking about those strategies and activities that align with these different components of the blueprint that we've worked with our students on that they can then use independently. So word meaning, one of the things we should be teaching our students in terms of vocabulary are independent word learning strategies. How can they infer the meaning of a word, for instance? They could use morphemes, the morphology, or they can use the context if the context is supported. So each of the suggestions here relate then to different ways in which meaning can go awry for the students, different speed bumps that they might encounter. The big question, does this make sense? If it doesn't, why not? And then breaking it down and modeling and teaching them how to do this and using what it is that you have taught them in terms of these different components of the blueprint. All right, so here's the blueprint again, bringing you back. And I would love to talk to you about every one of these components of the blueprint. You can see we're running short on time already. All right. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about is the language structures piece, the phrases, the clauses, the sentence comprehension. And I'm just going to give you a bit of the how, um, because in thinking about each one of these, one has to be thinking about what's the research? What does, has it told us? What do we mean by each one of these? All right. And then what it, is it that we can do? So we're going to focus a bit on the do. All right. Okay, so the big question here always, what are the critical and instructional approaches and activities that we should consider in designing and delivering instruction for each one of these? And I'm going to move past this particular slide very quickly, the next one, because of time. But I wanted us to be thinking about what it is that we currently use with our students and all of the challenges that our students face in working with, and this is an example of academic text, this comes from National Geographic. It's the mystery of the tattooed mummy. It's informational text, probably around third or fourth grade. And a quick read of this would tell you, all right, that there are many vocabulary words here that would need to be addressed, all right, both intentionally and incidentally. The other thing you would see is that there are sentences. For instance, there is a sentence here um, toward the end, the civilization's rulers who controlled and so on. That's quite long. It uses a relative clause that begins with the word who, all right? So these are challenges for our students and we need to be thinking about that. You also would be thinking about the fact that there's some background knowledge that's required here and maybe even knowledge of text structure. What kinds of paragraphs are these? Okay. So thinking through, as we think through these components of the blueprint, all right, that all of these relate back to just a simple paragraph it's not straightforward, as Kate Nation said. All right. So I'm going to focus then on which one? Here's that comprehension house again. I'm focusing on sentence comprehension. All right. And Cheryl Scott is one of the people who I have read quite a bit. Um, she's a speech language pathologist, now retired, who's written about syntax and sentence comprehension. All right. And she says to us that the sentence lies at the heart of communication here. Right? And that the rules of um, our language, grammar, allow for the creation of a number of sentences that serve as, are you ready, the worker bees of the text. All right? So when we think about the sentences, they, one by one, add up to the gist or the meaning of a particular paragraph, don't they? All right? we, we can simply read them. All right? We do bring a knowledge base, knowledge of word all right, to them. And we begin to construct those idea units. They're called propositions, idea units. That's that microprocessing I was talking about. All right. I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is, and Hollis was very wise in terms of when she talked about language structures, she didn't just talk about the syntax, right? She talked about semantics, semantics meanings, meanings of words, phrases, and so on. Syntax, the sentence, the order in which the words appear. And so these two are connected. This is that surface code I was talking about. When skilled readers come to text, what? They recognize and retrieve the meaning of the individual words, and then they work out the syntax, the structure, the sense of the sentence. So you're saying, what is she talking about syntax? And some of you know, but just in case you don't, all right, syntax represents the order and organization of words, phrases, clauses, to convey meaning 
through different types of sentences. It's a vehicle for conveying meaning. It uses those words, those word meanings, the semantics, and the way in which we place those words determines the meaning of the sentence. Madsen and Polson said this, syntax conveys information about how word meaning should be integrated into a proposition. That's an idea unit. So that the reader does not have to infer who did what to whom. When we understand syntax, the structure of sentence, right? When we understand how words contribute to meaning, then we're able to make sense of the sentence and answer questions like, where's the who or the what? Where's the do, right? Um, to whom was it done? And so on. And where we place the word in the sentence determines the function of the word, the meaning of the word. Think about the word compromise. It can be used as a who or a what. It also can be used as something that was done, all right? Where it's placed within the sentence, the structure of the word order gives us the meaning. Wow, they're intertwined, all right? Now, because I'm talking about syntax, I thought, oh, I have to ask you to think about what sentences are because syntactic structure has everything to do with the sentence. That is the way in which we express our meaning. So think for a moment about if I said to you, define a sentence, how you might define it. And again, you could use your facilitator guide or simply be thinking about this. Sentences. Now, oftentimes, all right, what I'll hear is a sentence is a complete thought. Absolutely right. I'll hear a sentence consists of a subject and a predicate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. There are different ways we can think about them grammatically. Um, we can think about a sentence structurally, but we also can think about a sentence from a language point of view or a linguistic point of view, right? And um, Louisa Motes really created this. <laughs> this was in module six of letters when I uh, co-authored the second edition um, with her. I'm just fortunate my name happens to be on that edition. And here's what she said. It's an abstract linguistic frame. That means it conveys meaning that has slots for categories of words and phrases. Are you thinking about what those categories might be? Parts of speech, different types of phrases, even clauses. They all carry meaning. So it's a vehicle for conveying idea units. It's a vehicle for conveying meaning, the sentence. So the blueprint does this. These are the questions the blueprint asks. All right, and what you see on the right-hand side all right, are the ways in which we build a sentence, parts of speech, phrases, clauses, sentence types. And oftentimes we think about defining these things, all right, and we think about these in a mechanical way. Think about function, think about what their jobs are. What's the job of the parts of speech? How do they convey meaning? What's the job of the phrase type? How does it convey meaning? And the clauses and the sentences. So here goes in terms of the blueprint questions. Are there parts of speech, phrases, clauses, sentence structures that may be difficult for your student? Hmm. How and when will you directly teach sentence comprehension? Will you have to teach it by teaching the function of these different parts of the sentence? How and when will you teach students to work with these structures? How will you facilitate, here comes that integration idea that I talked about earlier. How will you facilitate the integration of ideas, the use of what are called cohesive ties or ideas and connectives? How and when will you teach students to work with these? All right, so let's begin to think about this from a very basic point of view. Let's begin by thinking about, we need to directly teach our students how parts of speech work within sentences. Hmm. And in fact, when I think about a toolkit, that's where I begin. So here's the toolkit, all right, for thinking about sentence comprehension. On the left-hand side, we have intentional on purpose or direct ways of teaching sentence comprehension. And on the right-hand side, we have incidental and direct. Remember we very often, you know, oral language is the base. So some of these are oral language experiences, but also reading experiences and a writing connection. In terms of direct instruction, grammar-based deconstruction activities. Yes, I said grammar. But I'm not talking from a mechanical point of view, I'm talking from a meaning point of view, beginning with parts of speech. And I'm going to share something with you in a moment um, that 
will give you a sense of how to do this. And then sentence-based activities. And you see different ones represented here, right? I'm going to share something based on that as well. And then last but not least, cohesive device. And hopefully we'll have enough time to do that. So thinking through, all right, different types of activities that we can use, but always, always using the text. These are not separate, isolated, skill and drill type activities. They're activities based in working with what is contained within the text, right? So we might begin by thinking about, for our own knowledge, right, and then directly teaching our students the kinds of questions that the different parts of speech answer, because that has everything to do with function. And so I have some examples here, pronoun, and the example that I have comes from the mystery of the tattooed mummy, she. And then noun, mummy, again, from the mummy selection, the word found, verb, adjective, powerful, and so on. The examples are important because they would be the response to the questions that we might ask our students to complete. Now, ordinarily, if time allowed, I'd say to you, what questions do you think um, that when you ask questions about text, what questions do you think directly are tapping into these different parts of speech? But I'm gonna share that now with you. When you ask who, what, or whose questions, the answer could be pronoun, or if it's just who or what, it's a noun answer. So if I say to my student, who or what is this sentence about, all right? Well, it's about the mummy, that's a noun. And I can make that connection then in terms of the function of the noun. I'm not saying you shouldn't define these for students, but important in terms of meaning that we connect to the meaning. Is there was doing, that's a verb. What kind of words answer, which one, how many, what kind? Oh, those are adjectives, powerful. What's the, re oh, when, where, how, and why? Those are adverbs. What's the relationship between the words before and after, prepositions? what's connected or needs to be glued together, conjunctions. So this is a different way of thinking, perhaps for some of you, maybe not all, but important that we be thinking about meaning. All right. Now, here's an activity, all right, in which you would have to directly teach your students, all right, uh, the kinds of questions that parts of speech answer, or perhaps they're coming to you knowing this. And here's an activity that you might use with the selection um, which is called the founding of an American democracy or a selection that you would choose. This is informational text and the materials um, include word cards, which you see represented at the top and then a structured organizer, which does what? It reflects the kinds of questions that we might ask our students about sentences that we would find in this particular text. And so they would work either in partners or small group we might model to begin with um, using a similar set of words and this structured organizer. And then we would have them do the sort, right? So this is a quick sort, word cards, structured organizer. You have this in your participant guide, right? And if time allowed, I'd ask you to do the sort, but let's take a look at hopefully what your students might come up with. And here we have who or what, rights, democracy, colonists, balance, and so on, as there was doing, solve, disagreed, interprets, which one, what kind, how many, central, each, when, where, carefully, again, equally, All right? And you might be saying to yourself, oh, I see some words that could uh, be um, in a, another category. For instance, that word balance, that could also be over and is or was doing. And if that's where your students placed it, yes, and you'd have the conversation about how that word can be used in either, and it is the syntax or the word order that will tell you what the meaning of the word actually is. Now, one of the things you can do to adapt this is you might use pictures for sorts, all right, with younger children. Um, you also might think about phrases. You can take phrases, all right, and have a sort done with phrases because phrases answer similar questions. You also could be thinking about making certain that your words can be combined to make sentences, and this then could be used as an anagram activity. You still could use the structured organizer. They just would be building sentences using specific words that relate back to the topic. So this is just one type of activity uh, under grammar deconstruction. All right. So let's move on and think a little bit about sentence-based activities. 
All right. You want to make a writing connection. You always want to be thinking about these things, not in silos, but connected with one another, both reading and writing. Right. And I'm sure many of you were thinking as I was talking about this, that some of what I'm talking about teaching here can be taught and can be brought over or connected with or taught simultaneously um, with writing. So here, practice and process by asking your students to express all right, their understanding. The archaeologists discovered a mystery, and here's the cue for them, where and when, so they would be using different parts of speech. The founding fathers had to compromise. Well, now I ask why. Stalin controlled his people. How? Oh, I went a little deeper, didn't I? Now, one of the things that one might use are templates for designing simple compound complex sentences. And they're very similar to those structured organizers. And some of you probably already are using these sentence frames or sentence templates. And if that's what you need to do to scaffold for your students, that's what you would do. But you can see how I've directly used the text to have students practice the writing of sentence and making connection then, all right? And also those cues. All right, and then we can move on to cohesive device activities. All right, so one of the things that I talked with you earlier about was, you know, we work at the surface code with the vocabulary and the sentences, right? But then we want our students to be able to do what? That was microprocessing. We want them to do integration of meaning within and between sentences. We want them to be able to bridge and integrate the information. And there's two ways we do that through something called cohesive ties, and then through connectives. I'm not going to talk about connectives today, but they're primarily conjunctions, all right? I am going to talk about cohesive ties for just a moment or two. All right, both of these, connectives and cohesive ties, this kind of integration of meaning, this is a type of inference, and we don't often think about it as inference, but students have to kind of dig a little bit to see how they can make that connection. They have to go below the surface of the text that's implied, but these little structures help. So here are different types, all right, of um, cohesive ties. And you see on the left-hand side, different types defined. On the right-hand side, you see um, different examples from what? The one and only hyphen, all right? Around fifth grade uh, text. So pronoun reference, the author uses a pronoun to refer to a word found before or after in the text. Please call me the freeway gorilla, the one and only Ivan, silverback gorilla, um, and so on. And you can see I've highlighted the pronoun reference. The question would be, who's me? Who's mine? Who's I? And oftentimes our students will struggle with recognizing it's Ivan. And then substitutions, synonyms, all right? The author replaces a word or group of words in a text. People call me the freeway gorilla. And then you see the one and only Ivan, silverback gorilla, and so on. Who's the silverback gorilla? Oh, it's Ivan. And then repetition, all right? And we see Ivan repeated. And then sometimes ellip ellipsis. You tell me which ways are more fun and you have to go back to something that has already been stated within the text to fill that in. So these are cohesive ties and I'll show you very briefly. Um, this is a routine um, for cohesive ties. I'm going to show you very briefly an example. So here is that mystery of the tattooed money, mummy again. In the upper right-hand corner, you see that the teacher is going to identify the targeted word or phrase. It happens to be 20 something woman. Then the teacher is going to frame a question, do the searching, make the connection. So we always model the I do, we do, they do, or you do, <laughs> um, that explicit instruction. So in reading through this, all right, where did this some 20 something woman fit in? Um, certainly I would read it. I would say to my students, wow, there are a number of pronouns that are standing in or referring back to the 20 something woman. Can you find these pronouns, all right? Can you find these words, all right? Um, let's see if we can underline as many as we can find. So you can use a, some type of coding system up to you. And in fact, when you go through, you begin to see she, and you see her, and you see her, and so on. And the question becomes, who is she? Oh, it's the 20-something woman. 
while visiting her people. Whose people? Oh, the 20 something woman and so on. And we can do the same thing with synonyms or substitutions. Again, identifying the target phrase, um, framing a question. I'm going to look for all the words that can stand in. Perhaps it's one word, maybe it's a group of words that's standing in that mean the same thing for 20 something women. And this time I might use a different coding system. Arrows, all right. Oh, high priestess, warrior priestess, all right. Um, should also be star and the most elite figures. So who's the most elite figure? Oh, it's that 20 something woman. This is something as you recall earlier, I said, Kate Kane tells us our students who are struggling with comprehension have difficulty with. Last but not least, um, we're going to pause in a moment for some questions is I wanna point out to you that it is important for us to be thinking about all of these different components of the blueprint. But one of the ones that oftentimes gets neglected, that's not addressed within our curriculum is sentence comprehension. And the reality is when one begins to look at the sentences within the text that, that we're using for our students, all right, whether they be narrative or informational, that oftentimes the sentences are quite long, number of words. They're very dense, lots of idea units within one sentence. They have modifiers or clauses, all right? There's a long distance in between the who and the do, and they're written in passive voice rather than active voice. And it's Cheryl Scott um, and Catherine Balthazar who has written about this and identified these for us, all right? And I just pulled just a few sentences from the ant and the grasshopper, very um, young children, our fables, mystery of the tattooed mummy, third, fourth grade, founding of the democracy, American democracy, more sixth, seventh, long walk to water, again, more fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. And I could have pulled Stalin as well, which would be eighth and beyond. And you can begin to see that these sentences are long, but not only are they long, there's some dependencies, like in the first one, when the grasshopper, right? And then you see in the second sentence, a number of phrases that are embedded, all right, and then you see in the third sentence, a relative clause, who were key figures, that's particularly difficult for students, all right? And then in the last one, which is why, again, a clause. So we need to be thinking about all of this as we think about our texts, all right? So um, here's a last, well, almost a last question. Based on the science, what would your blueprint for comprehension instruction of your students' text include? And I will tell you, you cannot take all of this all on at once. Um, bit by bit is usually the best um, advice I can give. All right. So I want to end by saying um, that um, uh, I affirm, um, uh, or I hope um, I've helped you affirm um, that which you know, that which you brought, all right, um, to this discussion today. Um, I also hope that I've helped you acknowledge that there may be some things that um, you need to be thinking about in terms of change, in terms of um, uh, learning more about, perhaps. Um, there may be some actions that you can take immediately, or perhaps you want to talk with your colleagues about. And then, of course, I want to applaud you, each and every one of you, for recognizing that learning is our work. We're never done. Um, in order to best serve all of our students, um, we need uh, to keep at this. And so um, our students, as you can see um, on, um, this is my bookmark. Um, by the way, the Comprehension House was designed by my grandson, quite proud of him. Um, but here's what I have to say about this. Our students have the right to read with meaning. We have a responsibility to teach them how. Learning is not just the work of our students, but ours as well. So now I'm going to pause and I can't believe that I finished. I know that was a great deal of information. I want you to know that if you want to email me and ask me further questions, um, I will try my best to respond to those. Um, I want to encourage you to keep on with the good work that you're doing and once again, express my gratitude to you. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to ask Judith um, to join me. And again, Judith, I wanna thank all of you for um, this opportunity, the Florida 
IDA, the branch is doing outstanding work. I could not believe how many people signed up for this, but I know I've been following you. So thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us and thank you for that nice compliment. We really appreciate it. So again, I wanna thank you for this outstanding session. I don't know if you were able to keep up with the chat, but people are just putting comments one after the other, how outstanding and how much they've learned. And there were a few questions that I am gonna post now, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, I also want to, so I don't forget, want to thank our friend and colleague, Kristen Kohler from the Reading League Florida, who has been helping us keep up with the chat and the Q&A. So thank you so much, Kristen. And of course, Mandy for doing all this work. She is the hardest little worker bee, I think, in our group. So I want to shout out, you know, thank you so much to her. So one of the questions I think is, um, is there a website, a resource, or a tool? teachers can use to help with creating rich texts for struggling readers? Oh, for creating their own text? No, for, I guess, locating texts. That would be appropriate. Rich texts, you know, as I guess opposed to decodables or... Yeah, there are some programs out there that um, have begun to look at this topic, certainly, um, but I don't know um, of... Uh, specific lists, although uh, certainly the Library Association has put out you know, uh, lists of, of good reads for students. I love the question and it's not one I've really thought a lot about. So um, I think maybe that's something I need to get working on. I did have someone, I did have someone at a recent uh, presentation talk to me about the fact that she was creating a list um, of informational and narrative texts on big topics or enduring understandings that um, she might be willing to share with me. So um, stay tuned. If I, if I come up with something, I'll send it to you and then you can blast it out. Yeah, okay, maybe some achieve the core. Yeah, there are a number of, yep, some people are putting some suggestions in. There are a number of uh, different um, programs and curricula that are out there that, that do this, yeah, core knowledge and so on, yeah. Right. Core knowledge, right, is one of them. Um, yeah. I also, I, I think I need a little clarification because I think some people who are using a very structured literacy, maybe Orton Gillingham approach yeah. based program, yeah. Um, need to hear you say, which I, this is how I interpret it, that some of these texts that we use early on are not meant for the students to read themselselves, but for us to read to them, to yes. talk, um, and the difference between listening comprehension and reading comprehension. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's important that we that we keep in mind that we're we're always moving from our oral language to our written language, and that we have a responsibility to, first of all to teach students how to translate um, and to to move to written language. But secondly, I think that from the time um, they come to us in school. Um, and as they move through school, if they have not yet acquired word recognition skill, then we need to be reading to them or providing them with access to texts that are age and grade appropriate. And oftentimes those are texts that are being used in the, in the general education classroom. Um, there is some differences between listening and reading comprehension, certainly, but the blueprint can be used for both. I mean, this is not something that is, is designed just for reading by um, eye. It's also designed for reading by ear. So yes, and the decodable texts are wonderful. And sometimes you can really mine them for some wonderful conversations. Um, but I think we need to keep in mind that um, uh, their purpose is not specifically that. It is to provide the practice in, in, in uh, different patterns that words present. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm just trying to keep up with the chat here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kristen or Mandy, have, have you seen anything that I missed here? Um, I mean, there's so many love this best presentation, you know, ever. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> so I want you to know that that is in the chat. Um, there was a question about using this with younger students. I yeah. believe second grade was referenced, yeah. but yes. Nancy, I know you probably can make suggestions for any student who's beginning to deal with comprehension, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, yeah, when I wrote when I wrote the book, and as I speak with people, by the way, the book came out of training. I mean, <laughs> I was, you know, I first uh, talked about comprehension um, uh, when I began to, well, not first talked about it, but I really got deeply into conversation when I began to work with Louisa Motes um, and, and then co-authored th that module on comprehension. So most of my work, my thinking, uh, started there and um, and has developed. And then I developed workshop and training and people kept saying, where's the book? 
And I said, well, here's the book. <laughs> okay, finally. But the book this was book. written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But this is not about the book per se. It's about really getting this knowledge base out to individuals. So, um, so yes, I wrote the book for K through eight primarily, although it can be used with students certainly in the secondary setting. Um, but um, I, I do reference, um, and I have talked about the differences with dis between disciplinary literacy, some of the, you know, the characteristics of uh, science, social studies texts, and so on. Um, but uh, I today did not delve deeply into that. And you need to do some adaptation. But so primarily K through eight. And in second grade, many of our struggling readers are not reading. So it's, it, you know, they're not independent yet. So it's listening, but they need to hear those books from the time they're little. Yeah. I love your, the, your phrase of reading by ear and reading by eye, because I think that is so important. And I think that actually incorporates the simple view of reading, right? Where we have that yes. listening or language comprehension yes. and the decoding yes. or word recognition. Yes, yes. So, and, and, and the reading rope began with language comprehension orally. I mean, when you look at the research that she did, it was with the little at-risk readers um, early on. <laughs> yeah. Right. I did want to answer one question so I don't forget. And then I think there's a couple more coming up. Um, the book study dates, just for those of you who may want to mark your calendar, um, chapter four is scheduled for June 29th, chapters five and six, July 13th, and this is all on our website, chapters um, seven and eight, July 27th, and chapter nine and the wrap up on August 3rd. And again, they're all free. They're all on Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. And uh, of course, we can't, um, what word do I want to say, um, be as insightful as Nancy, but we're gonna do our best. We're, all, we're taking turns. Some of us um, have volunteered to facilitate these chapters, but it would be great if you all who are interested do get a copy of your book beforehand. Um, all the um, questions are in the book, so we will be sending them out to you as well. And I know people said it's available on Amazon, but if you go to Brooks Publishing, there is a discount available. You just put the code blueprint and you will get, I think, Mandy, is it a 15% discount? I, I forgot what they're offering, but it is a discount. Um, so I, um, Yes, there is a discount, and I forgot what it is, too. Okay. <laughs> I know somebody commented that you could get it on Amazon, and I did that and didn't get the discount. So I think if you go to Brooks, you're more likely to get that discount. Right. You have to go to Brooks for the discount. But if you do use Amazon, remember Amazon Smile and check IDA Florida as your organization, <laughs> because every little um, donation that comes to the group is, is helpful. So there was one question, Nancy, about executive function. Yeah, yeah. So, so certainly executive function plays a role, not just in reading comprehension, but in all learning activities. And um, it, comprehension monitoring very closely connects, I think, with the ability to um, you know, be organizing and understanding where you're having difficulties and, and being purposeful um, in planning. Um, uh, it, Lori Cutting is a very good, she's a very good resource in terms of reading comprehension and executive functioning if you want to read more about it. Yeah, she's at Vanderbilt. Yeah. And then there's a question, can you discuss how concept imagery plays into this? You know what, I haven't really looked into that other than to say that I have embedded within um, the routines activities that I've talked about. Um, visualization, visual image, and so on. So I'm not as familiar with concept imagery. It would be interesting to hear from someone who is, how they think they can make a connection. In fact, this is the value of having a book talk or even informal discussions with one another because you can bring forward your knowledge base and make those connections. Yeah. Thank you. And I think visualizing is always a big part of comprehension, right? It so is. Yes. Imagining, it's, it's critical. Yes. Um, yes. And I think some of our students don't know how to do that. And I always tell people because everything is in their face nowadays, they don't have to think about it so much and, yeah. and build those mental um, images in their brain, right? Yeah. That's what is happening and what they're reading. So yeah. Um, yeah. people yeah. continue to ask about the slides and the participation guide, which in, it's all in the chat and we will send that as a follow-up email and it will be on our website as well with the registration um, will be coming up this week for those book study sessions as well. Um, Kristen and Mandy, did I miss anything? I well, spy one more question about Vanderbilt. Oh, okay. 
a name from the person for Vanderbilt again, please? Yeah, so it's Dr. Dr. Lori Cutting, C-U-T-T-I-N-G. She's done quite a bit of work in terms of the neural imaging, in terms of reading comprehension, and has written about executive functioning. Thank you. Yes, and somebody also mentioned Alinda Mood Bell's uh, verbalizing, visualizing mm -hmm. program that, that um, talks yeah. about that concept as well. Yeah. Uh, there's so many good things out there now, you know, sometimes it's well, there are. well, there are. And I, I think what I think what one has to do is be thinking about what's my focus. If I'm developing vocabulary, what's the literature telling me? What's sentence kind what's the literature telling me? And then how can I match up? Um, because you know, just thinking about strategies in general, they're wonderful strategies, but it's being focused on is it process or product focused? And how do I make an, a match to help develop these um, skills, capabilities, and knowledge base? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. I can't thank you enough for this. Oh, your I love it. And your... There's one more question. Okay. Let's see. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so, Nancy, you reference this is from the chat. You referenced uh, the blueprint is KA focused. Although the information is still relevant, I was hoping for resources designed for grades nine through 12. Are there any resources that you know of for yeah. nine through 12 students and teachers? Yeah, please email me. My email was at the end and I can provide you with some resources on disciplinary literacy um, uh, so that one could take um, uh, to, uh, to take a look at the blueprint and be thinking how one might elaborate on or implement, supplement with some of this knowledge on disciplinary literacy. I have a very brief part in the book about it, but I can provide you with some additional resources. So email me um, about that. Thank you. Anything else, Mandy or Kristen for Nancy before we close up? I, I think that's it. Uh, there are a lot of praises for how yes. much people have enjoyed this webinar um, and the yes. content. And of course your lovely presentation, Nancy. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks. one more time, I want to thank Nancy, Kristen, Mandy, our friends and colleagues at the Reading League Florida, of course, our full board IDA Florida, and, um, and all of you for taking the time today to join us, uh, ask questions and provide some feedback, and please keep in touch with us. Um, please join us. If you're not a member, please join us. And also, I want you to save the date for our in-person conference, the first one since COVID, which is scheduled for October 7th and 8th this coming up year in Orlando. We're going to be at a beautiful hotel, and we have some wonderful presenters, including Marianne Wolf, which will be virtual, uh, Laura Stewart, Jared Blank. Uh, we're going to have Mary Dahlgren from Tools for Reading, and we're going to talk about sound walls. So a lot of great information, sponsors, exhibitors, registration information will be coming soon on our website. So please look for that. Also, please sign up for the book study sessions and Thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend and a happy, enjoyable, and relaxing summer. Goodbye, all my friends, nationally and internationally, and thank you, Florida. <laughs> thank you, Nancy, so all much. Right. Bye, right. everybody. Thanks. Bye. -bye. So much. Bye. Judy? Yes? Do you want to stay on for a sec? Yes, please. Okay. Kristen, Mandy, if you can stay on for a second, that would be great. Um, and not everyone's left yet, so I don't know. Stop the recording, Chris. Mandy. And, um, oh, yeah, I will. Um, and we still have um, quite a few attendees who are still exiting.